Hi, thank you so much for clicking on this video. Regardless of whatever part of the world you're watching from, you are highly welcome. My name is Cecilia and I am highly privileged to serve in the ushering department of the Redeemed Christian Church of God, The Throne Room. I believe, and as a church, we believe that the video you're about to watch will bless you immensely. And I would ask you that if you have not subscribed to this channel, please do so so that you could be blessed by more of our content. So let's jump right into it. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Tunde, and your beautiful wife. Thank you for always uh, being gracious. Amen. Hallelujah. It's always a uh, pleasure and a privilege to be before God's people. I thank God for the grace of God upon your life. Amen. Hallelujah. Just look at your neighbor and smile. Amen. Just, just smile. Just smile. Don't smile like uh, we smile in America. You know, in America, we have this artificial smile. You know, we smile like this. But in in Nigeria, we smile with our full teeth, you know. Amen. Just look at the man smile. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm, I'm here with my wife. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you for, for your support. Amen. I bring you greetings from the River of Life Church in Maryland. Hallelujah. Amen. We'll go straight to the world. Let's open our Bibles quickly to Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 22. Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 22. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? Or why then are people not recovered from their sicknesses? Why all the deaths? The writer here was asking, is there no balm in Gilead? I'll be talking about true worship today. I'll be talking about true worship. Gilead bordered the Jordan River and was known to grow a tree that produced a balm or medicine that was used uh, to heal wounds. It was also known for good physicians. It was also a place of worship. But despite the, the medicines and, and the good physicians there and the worship, uh, people were dying from their sicknesses. That's why the prayers and the fasting, uh, people were still dying. And that was why this question was asked. Is there no balm in Gilead? Are there no physicians there? Uh, something happened that caused the medications and the, and the physicians not to be effective uh, because they were no longer worshiping the true God. They were no longer worshiping the creator. Jehovah was no longer the object of their worship. Uh, they began to worship idols. An idol is anything that takes the place of God in your life. Our God is a jealous God. In Exodus chapter 34, verse 10, the Bible says that his name is jealous. So he's not only Jehovah Shammah, he's not only Jehovah Rapha, he's not only Jehovah Sikhen, he's Jehovah jealous. And if you've, ever, if you've ever been in love, you never mess with a jealous lover. So God wants to know where you spend your time and what you spend your money on. Anything that has relegated God to the background uh, becomes your idol. Hallelujah. But our God, our God deserves to be number one, not number two in our lives. So uh, in, in Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 1 to 2, you see why uh, there was death in Gilead, despite the balm or the medication, and despite the good physicians and the worship. It says in verse 1 to 2, it talks about the worship of other gods. The gods you have loved, in verse 2. The gods you have served. The gods you have walked or followed. The gods you have sought or worshipped. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 2. Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 2. This is the sequence. They were given to an idol what they should have given to God. He says you have followed, you have loved idols. You have served idols. You have walked or followed them. You have sought and worshipped them. They gave to idols what they should have given to God. In worship, we must love God. In true worship, we must serve him. In true worship, we must 
walk or follow him. And we must seek him. In Romans chapter 1 verse 21, the Bible says that even though they claim to know God, they did not honor or worship him as God. Romans chapter 1 verse 21. They knew God, but they, they did not worship or honor him as God. They honored him, but they did not honor him as God. It is not enough to know God, but God deserves all the honor. Hallelujah. Even though they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were they thankful. Many claim they know God, but they don't give God the honor he deserves. And in verse 25, he says they served him, but they don't serve him as God. You see, God is jealous. God, is, you see, who changed verse 25? And worship and serve the creature more than the creator. So you may say you're serving God, but you're serving the, create, the, the creature more than the creator. You see, once, once there's a shift in your service, you're serving God, but you're, you're more committed to your work uh, than you are committed to God. You serve the creature more than the creator. Once that begins to happen, your worship is no longer a true worship. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 2, the New Living Translation says that in the last days, in the last days, perilous times will come. Perilous times are difficult times. And we are in the last days. Difficult times shall come. Yeah, perilous times, dangerous times. Not because of nuclear weapons or nuclear wars, but because men shall be lovers of themselves and their money. A man who loves himself and his money is more dangerous than a nuclear weapon. And we're in the last days where men are self-driven. Men love themselves. They, they don't love people. They don't love God. They are self-centered rather than God-centered. A man who loves self will, will, will not mind if people are dying around him. Amen. A man who loves himself will just do things to gratify himself. A man who loves his money, he says men shall be lovers of the money. A man who loves his money will not give towards advancing the kingdom of God. A man who loves his money is dangerous, will bury money underneath the ground while people are dying. So he says in the last days, men shall love themselves and love their money. A man who loves his money will not even give God 10%. Only 10, look at nobody say only 10%. Only 10%. Amen. Hallelujah. So where, where, when we begin to worship ourselves and worship our money, God is no longer the object of worship. When you are money driven, you will not give to the poor. You will not give to the advancement of God's kingdom. Satan knows how to cause this shift. Cause your worship to shift from the creator to the creature, so that your worship, so that our gatherings will be in vain, so that despite our prayers, despite our, 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 our fasting, nothing will seem to happen. And we'll be asking, is there no, is there no balm in Gilead? But there's a balm in Gilead. Uh, amen. The great physician is in the house, and there'll be healing in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, the first, the first worshiper was Lucifer. The first worshiper was Lucifer. Um, he was worshiping well. He was worshiping God. The Bible says that he was perfect in all his ways. He had more access to God than any other uh, angel. And the Bible says until iniquity was found in him. Until pride uh, uh, kicked in. One day he said, why should I worship this, this God? I, I, I deserve to be worshipped myself. And he was able to uh, convince a third of the angels. Amen. So in, in heaven, there were two worship sessions. A third of the angels worshipped, worshipped uh, uh, Lucifer, while two thirds worshipped God. And any time you take what God deserves, there is war. So war broke out in heaven. And Lucifer was cast out from heaven. That is why you see churches, they grow and they split. 
or in, 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 in marriages, uh, there's divorce because some, somebody has touched what belongs to God. Hallelujah. He deserves all the glory. Anytime you touch worship, watching, worship should be given to God exclusively. Some people worship their spouse, they worship their children, uh, some people worship their pastor. Anytime you take what belongs to God, there will be, be a breakout of war. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. So the Bible says in Ezekiel 28 verse 16, by the multitude of thy merchandise, Lucifer started to trade and commercialize his gift as it is now, especially in the music industry. People commercialize the gift. Once you begin to do that, merchandising, buying and selling, once you begin to do that, you, 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 you pay more attention to your gifts than to God in your worship. Uh, it pollutes and contaminates the worship. It is no longer true worship. But that will not be a portion in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. So Satan, Satan understands that once he's able to contaminate the worship and change the focus from, from the creator to the creature, the, the, the prayers and the fastings uh, uh, becomes in vain. There will be no healing. There will be no breakthrough. But that will not be our portion in Jesus' name. Let us see Amos chapter 5. From verse 21 to 24, the message translation, if we have it. Amos chapter 5, from verse 21 to 24. Do we have the message translation? Yes. Message. Do we have message translation? Yes. It says, I can't stand your religious meetings. This is God speaking. I'm fed up with your conferences and conventions. I want nothing to do with your religious projects, your pretentious slogans and goals. I'm sick of your fundraising schemes, your public relations and image making. I've had all I can take of your noisy ego music. When was the last time you sang to me? Do you know what I want? I want justice, yes. He says, when was the last day? You know, it is possible to, to, to be singing, but you're singing to yourself and not to God. The same question, is there a balm in Gilead? Are there great physicians in Gilead? If so, why all the deaths? Despite the worship. The same question was asked in America during the COVID, where more than one million people died. The same question was asked, is there no balm in America? America is reputed to have the best medications, the best physicians, and yet, yet more than a million people died. America is also a place of worship, but people died. According to predictions, we expected more deaths in Africa, where we don't have the privilege of medications, and most of the doctors have jackpot. You know, so, so we expected that question. No medications, no physicians. But in America, in America, people were dying like flies. People were dying like flies. Gilead, Gilead was reputed to be the place to go for medical treatment. In Jeremiah 46, verse 11, even the Egyptians were going to Gilead for, for treatment because of the balm there, that tree that produced that balm, that medication. But people were still dying because uh, the medications and, the, and the, uh, uh, the effectiveness of the physicians was no longer in place again because worship was altered. Worship was altered. Worship is more than a song. It is a lifestyle. It, in, it involves demonstrating his what? Worship, worship, his what, his value. It is more than a song. In the choices we make, we demonstrate that God has more value than money. So if God has more value than money, I will not be reluctant to give up anything for him. Can somebody say amen? Yes. Hallelujah. 
So it, worship is a lifestyle we demonstrate by the choices we make. Who are God is what has more value. You'll be willing to, 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 to pay thousands of naira or dollars for uh, what you consider valuable, a designer belt or handbag, because of the what you attach to it. You see, uh, when if God has more worth than money, if God has more worth, you will give him your time and you, you will sacrifice, you will give him your all. Can somebody say amen? Hallelujah. You will be ready to spend all of your money and all of your time because God has what? Look at it and say, my God has what? My God is not a cheap God. Hallelujah. So in true worship, we demonstrate also our love. Our love. Worship is love. Worship is love. In de you demonstrate your love. Your love for him. Hallelujah. You see, your love involves intimacy. Love is relational. Love is relational. You know, versus religion. Many people are religious. But Jesus came to establish re relationship. Everything he did was about relationship. He came down from heaven to relate with us. Otherwise, he would have stayed in heaven and maybe uh, emailed salvation. But he came down because he wanted to relate with us. He gave us his name because he wanted to relate with us. You see, for me to begin a relationship with you, I must know your name. He gave us his name to call him. He called us his friends because he wanted relationship. Amen. Hallelujah. He, he, he shed his blood for us to grant us access into his presence because he, he, he wanted relationship. He gave us his spirit for us to become like him. Everything Jesus did was to enhance relationship. Amen. He does not love religion. Some people are just religious. Many are here today because uh, there's no work. Amen. But when you love him, when you love him, you become relational. He said, if you, don't, if you don't praise me, if you don't praise me, there's stones. I will raise stones to praise me. Hallelujah. But he, he did not say that when it comes to worship. You cannot, stones cannot replace us in worship because stones cannot relate with God. You see, you, we can all praise God, but we cannot all worship him. Because worship, worship, is, worship, worship involves more than praise. Anybody can praise God. For you to worship God, you must be in the spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. You can praise God because uh, uh, God bless you. You praise God for what God has done. But worship is spiritual intercourse. It's, it, is, it is going beyond the veil. Worship. You're worshiping God for who he is. Hallelujah. Am I talking to somebody here today? Amen. For who he is, not for what he has done. You're just expressing your love to him. How many worshipers do we have here? You just love God. Worship is intimacy. Hallelujah. Stones can replace you in praise, but stones cannot replace your worship. Hallelujah. Worship. In worship, worship involves giving, giving God your best. God so loved that he gave. Hallelujah. You don't give God tips. You give your best. Amen. Hallelujah. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8, it says, uh, through our giving, we, we prove the sincerity or genuineness of our love. Of our love. The devil wants you to worship God without your money. You know, in Exodus, Exodus chapter 10, when, when uh, 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 Moses was negotiating with Pharaoh, he says, he says you can go and worship your God, but leave, leave your, your heads behind, your animals. And Moses said, no, we are going to worship our God. We will not leave even the hoof behind. Amen. Amen. We are not coming to worship God without our pocketbook. We must worship God with everything we have. Hallelujah. In John chapter 4, verse 23 to 24, he says, But the time cometh, and now is, when true worshipers, hallelujah, when the Bible talks about true worshipers, it means they are fake. Look at everybody and say, are you fake? True worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit. Everybody say in spirit. And in truth. For the Father seeketh such. 
The father seeketh such. So it has nothing to do with location. We emphasize location and denomination. It is not mentioned here. He said, God is a spirit. Hallelujah. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit. So to worship God, you must take off your clothes because it's intercourse. Take off your flesh. And you must be in the spirit. God is a spirit. Hallelujah. True worshipers must worship him in truth and in spirit. In truth means in sincerity and honesty. You must love him sincerely. Not because of what he has to offer. You know, many people have turned God into a sugar daddy. You know, you must love him. Amen. Sincerely. Not because you want a breakthrough. You love him. Amen. And in spirit. Everybody say in spirit. In spirit means with your heart. Your heart must be involved in this relationship. If your heart is not involved, it becomes ritualistic. It becomes mechanical. Amen. God wants your heart. Hallelujah. God tracks your heart. He wants to know where your heart is. You know, uh, when I come to Nigeria, my son in the U.S. will be tracking all my movements. And I said, how do you know my movement? He said, Daddy, I, I, I'm tracking your movements. God is tracking your heart. Whether you're here, amen. Where, where is your heart? Look at anybody and say, where is your heart? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. He seeketh such. He's, he's seeking for true worshipers. No wonder in Psalm 89 verse 20, he says, I have found David my servant. Hallelujah. Many look for God but never find him. But when God is looking for you, he says, I have found David my servant. Amen. David was a worshiper in the wilderness. And God located him. God will locate those who serve. Amen. Servants. God is looking for servants. Amen. I found David and I've anointed him with oil. May God locate you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. I say may God locate you in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'll give one example of a true worshiper in the Bible. Amen. Um, uh, in Matthew chapter 15 from verse 22 to 28. Jesus goes to a Gentile territory and he, 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 he meets this woman in verse 22. Matthew 15, verse 22, 28. The Bible says, she cried unto him and said, have mercy on me. Because her daughter was, was vexed with an evil spirit. Matthew 15, from verse 22. She cried unto the Lord. But the Bible says in verse 23, uh, in verse, but he answered her not a word. Listen. He answered her not a word. He answered her not a word. She cried unto God, but he answered her not a word. What do you do when it appears God is not answering your prayers? Your serving. He answered her not a word. This is where many people will quit. He answered her not a word. But she did not quit because we will find out that she was a true worshiper. The three Hebrew boys, when they were told to bow, to the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. The king had ordered that at a certain time, they will play music and all his citizens will bow to his statue. The only three boys refused to bow. So they went and told the king, and the king said, well, let us give them a second chance. Maybe they don't like the music. Let's play reggae. Let's play reggae. So they changed the music. And the boys, this, this young boys, they said, look, look, we are not going to even debate about this matter. They told the boys, if you don't bow, you will burn. If you don't bow, you will burn in the furnace. They said, look, if our God does not answer us, huh, we will not bow to your God. That is true worship. We will not quit. We will not quit. You know, uh, 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 Apostle Paul prayed three times. He had a thorn in his flesh. I'm talking about what you do when it appears God is saying no. Will you still worship him? Will you still come to church? Apostle Paul prayed three times and God said, look, I will not answer this, this prayer. 
He said, I will give you grace. This stone will not kill you, but I will give you the grace. I will give you the grace. You need this stone to keep you in check. You need this stone to keep you humble. So anybody who tells you that anytime you pray, you receive your, I, there are some, there are some. There, if God had answered all my prayers, I was, I was in the world. If God answered all my prayers, I, I don't think, I, maybe I'll not be here preaching. But God leaves a problem, distributes problems. The Bible says man was born into trouble. It seems God prescribes trouble to everyone. If it's not your children, it is your family. If it's not your family, it's hell. It is some, it, there's everybody. Something to keep us on our toes. Because God sees, he knows if he takes away all your problems, five years, five years from now, maybe you'll backslide. Hallelujah. He said, my grace is sufficient. Lift up your hands and say, thank God for grace. That sickness, that problem will not kill you in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, God, Jesus answered her not a word. Jesus answered another word. And to make matters worse, his disciples said, send her away. Let's see verse 23. Send her away. Can you imagine coming to a church and the leaders don't want you? Send her away. The environment was hostile. He said, send her away. But she refused to be sent away because she was a true worshiper. Hallelujah. Amen. Look at the and say, I refuse to be sent away. You cannot send me away from here because I'm a true worshiper. Hallelujah. She was not there. She was not there to seek the approval of man. She was there to seek Jesus Christ. Verse 24. And Jesus now makes matters worse and said, I'm not sent to you. Let's see verse 24. It says, I'm not sent to you but unto the lordship of the house of Israel. If that were to be today, they would say, this, this, this pastor Jesus is, is racist. He's, 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 he's tribal. Can you imagine what he told me? That uh, he's, not, he's not sent. But it was just a test. Jesus would test the status of your worship, whether you're for real. In verse 25, in the midst of all this, she still remains and refuses to quit. Look at everybody and say, I will not quit. Verse 25. Then she came and worshipped him. Can you imagine? She came and she worshipped him. Despite what was happening. Because she was a true worshipper. Today, many believers jump from church to church. From one church to... I, 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 I just imagine when we get to heaven, they will, they will bring out a dozier or the list, your, your CV, the churches you've attended. Mom must work ministry. You chop a church, push me, I push you. Eh? Talita Kumi ministries. Eh? They will see the dozier. And God will say, what, what were you looking for? It has nothing to do with location. You must be in the spirit and, it, and you must love him sincerely. Hallelujah. She refused to quit. She refused to quit. Don't be a nomadic Christian. Don't be a nomad. You see, when you run from church to church, you teach your children how not to take God serious. You establish a pattern of nomadism in Christianity, but that will not be a portion in Jesus' name. In verse 26, Jesus digs further to determine her status as a worshiper. Verse 26, let's see verse 26. He answered and said, it is not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. I think the Gentiles were called dogs. And maybe he called her a dog. She would have felt insulted. That's, you know, many will say, look, I've had enough. I've had enough. First, you, you did not answer me. Then your leaders wanted to send me away. Now, you are calling me a dog, but she refused to leave. In verse 27, he called her a dog, and she said, man of God, she said, truth, Lord. Truth, Lord. I'm a dog. I'm a dog. She did not argue. Some people come to church to argue. Argument, debate, 
Oh, he's tied in the Old Testament. I don't know why they argue that here. Is it that? Just argument. She said, truth, Lord. Yes. You know, your Bible will say, Lotho. Hebrews will say, is Yoku. Say, yes, I'm a dog. I'm a dog. She refused to quit. In spite of the names she was being called, she was submitted to the authority of Jesus Christ. She said, yeah, the dogs eat the crumbs that, they, that falls from the table. I'm so hungry that I will even settle for your crumbs. I'm so hungry for you. You are the lo- loaf. You are the bread of life. The crumbs contain the same chemical composition as the, as the loaf. I'm ready. I'm so hungry. I, I will be, I'm, I'll be satisfied with the crumbs. Then in verse 28, Jesus says, Great is thy faith. Be done unto thee, even as thou wilt. And his daughter was made whole from that very hour. True worship activated the great physician and the deliverer. In true worship, the balm is active. The balm kicks in. Hallelujah. Is there a balm? Yes, there is a balm. Yes, the great physician is in the house. Instead of healing and deliverance services, what we need is true worshipers and true worship. Because in true worship, we create the right atmosphere for the great physician to show up. When he shows up, when he shows up, you see, all these deliverance and healing services, all you need is to create the, It's about atmospheric change. Creating the climate for the great physician, the greatest doctor to show up. Hallelujah. When he comes, if his blood cleanses our field, his blood is a cleansing agent, cleanses the sins, the field of sin. You see, sin is a breeding ground for sickness and disease. Sin is a breeding ground for sickness and disease. There's no medication that can cure sin. In Mark chapter 2, a man with palsy, a man with palsy is lowered down. They had to destroy the roof to lower him down so that Jesus would heal him. He was paralyzed. And Jesus saw their faith. And Jesus says, your sins are forgiven thee. Arise, take up thy bed and go thy way. The great physician made the right diagnosis. That this man's paralysis was not because he had stroke. It wasn't because of witchcraft. But it was because of his sins. You see, I I practiced medicine in this country before I left for America. And one of the greatest challenges we had was misdiagnosis. The reason why many people die here is misdiagnosis. You have something, but they are treating you for something else. But the great physician does not misdiagnose. He saw the man and he said that your situation is not witchcraft. It is not stroke. It is not muscular dystrophy or weakness. You had this stroke because of sin. And he said, your sins are forgiven. This great physician, when he shows up, even his words, his words, the Bible says that the, the word, his, his word is medicine or health to our flesh. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 22. His words, this great, just, so just taking the word of God three times a day, taking the word of God, T-I-D, three times a day, it is healing. Psalm 107, verse 20, he sent his word and he healed them. He delivered them from destruction, his word. This great physician is the, is the prince of peace. The prince of peace. The prince of peace. Many go to the United Nations seeking for peace. Peace is not the cessation of war. Peace is a person. Jesus is the prince of peace. Hallelujah. He's the prince of peace. Am I talking to somebody here? Many go to, uh, on vacation looking for peace. Go to peaceful environments looking for peace but you see there's a peace that passes all understanding Philippians chapter 4 verse 7 there's a peace the world cannot offer you that pass peace in the midst of the storms you're facing eviction your marriage is on the rocks but you still have peace, internal peace peace that you cannot explain hallelujah 
Amen. Peace. That is the peace he offers. When Jesus was living the earth, he told his disciples, my peace I leave unto you. He didn't say, I leave you wealth. I, I, he did not say, I leave you houses. He said, my peace. Because peace is a scarce commodity. Without peace, there is unrest. Unrest. You know, in America, I always tease, I always tease my uh, parishioners, people walking all the shifts. They're walking, but no peace. Children are walking. Even the pets are walking. But they cannot make ends meet. See, no peace. No peace, no sleep. Where there's no peace, there's anxiety. No peace, anxiety. If Michael Jackson could sleep, if Michael Jackson could sleep, he, he would be alive today. With all his billions, he could not sleep. You see, but if I tell you to fall asleep now, many of you will fall asleep easily. Just thank God for sleep. He gave his beloved sleep. You know, you, you know when, when I go to Lagos, underneath the bridge, I've, I see people, despite the human traffic, and the vehicular traffic, people are sleeping soundly. And Michael Jackson, uh, in his mansion, could not sleep. Just thank God for sleep. You see, as a psychiatrist, most of the uh, conditions I, I treat is insomnia and anxiety. Anxiety, insomnia. People cannot sleep. Can you imagine? Not being able to sleep. Anxiety. The Bible says peace that passes all understanding and peace that is able to keep your heart. To keep your heart from heart attack. This peace will keep your heart from arrhythmia, irregular heartbeat, from, from, from high blood pressure, from heart failure. This peace keeps your heart and also keeps your mind from racing thoughts, from bipolar disorder, from schizophrenia. Uh, this peace is able to keep your heart and your mind. May the peace of God keep your heart and your mind in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Keep, keep you from depression. People committing suicide from depression. This peace will keep your mind. May God keep your mind in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. When, when the great physician is activated through, through worship, through worship, he shows up. You see, many times you call your doctors and the doctor is not available. You know, like, you know, here when you call, they say, all lines are busy. Please call back later. Uh -huh. But in Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 3, say, call upon me and I will answer. He's always, he, when you call God, he doesn't go to the voicemail. He said, I will answer and I will show you greater and mighty things in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. In true worship, the great physician shows up. He does house calls. He shows up. He comes to your house. Hallelujah. He comes to your house. Whether you have money or not, he comes. Hallelujah. He even paid a house visit to a man called the madman of the gatherings. He went to the tomb. A house visit. He went to the gatherings. Dr. Jesus, can you imagine? Going to a city, not for sightseeing, but to the tomb to locate a man. A man whom society had, 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 had forgotten. They confined him to the tomb. He was a hopeless case. He was in chains. He was cutting up. He was crying. He could not sleep night and day. Forgotten to die. He was living with the dead. But Jesus made a house call there. And cast out. The Bible says that when the man saw Jesus, he ran to him, towards him and he worshipped him. He worshipped him. In Mark chapter 5 verse 6, he ran towards him and he worshipped him. Hallelujah. You see, when you worship, when you're a true worshiper, you, you tie the hands of God. Or, or, or God is moved to act on your behalf. Hallelujah. He worshipped him. Our great physician shows up in true worship. He's a specialist. 
You know, many times when you go to a specialist uh, uh, you, or, you, or you go to a doctor, they may send you to somebody else who specializes in what you have. But he specializes in all cases. In all cases. Hallelujah. You know, doctors are called medical practitioners. We are called practitioners because we practice. We practice. Somebody who practices, you just try and error. That's why today they'll say, don't eat palm oil. Tomorrow they'll say, eat palm oil. Tomorrow, you know, they just confuse you. Because we practice. But Jesus does not practice. <laughs> Hallelujah. This doctor I'm talking about, he does not practice. He heals. You see, when you go to a doctor, and the doctor says, come back in one month, what he's telling you in essence is that, I don't have a cure. Come back in one month. Follow up. You see, it is good for business. Oh. You see, if, 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 I, if I could heal all my patients and they don't come for follow-up, then there'll be no money. It is good. It is good for business. But Dr. Jesus, when you go to him, he does not practice. Hallelujah. There is no practice. Hallelujah. Amen. He's here to heal in the name of Jesus Christ. Many go to doctors and they are confused. They are, they are confused. They are just confused. Somebody, somebody went to a doctor and uh, the doctor gave him a syrup that was written, shake before use. And uh, the man got home and be, he just began to shake. And he had a headache. He went to the doctor and said, doctor, you're quack. Uh, the doctor said, how did you use it? And the man started to vibrate. Another man, another man went, to, he went to the doctor, and the doctor prescribed it. He said, you need a stool softener. So anyway, we, he went, he carried his pillow along, and put it on the stool and sat down. And they asked him, what are you doing? He said, my doctor said, I need a stool softener. This medical practitioner we're talking about. Hallelujah. He's a high priest that is, that is touched with the feeling of our infirmity. He has compassion. He, has comp he understands our weaknesses. He understands he's a compassionate doctor. You know, some doctors are not compassionate. They're just after money. A man went to his doctor and said, Doctor, I am beginning to lose my memory. And the doctor called the secretary and said, Send this man the bill before he forgets to pay his... Hallelujah. Amen. The great physician is a miracle worker. The blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus is a potent, is so potent. You know, in the normal blood in the blood bank uh, breaks down, undergoes hemolysis after a few weeks, right? But the blood of Jesus, uh, more than 2,000 years ago, still remains potent. Hallelujah. This blood has a voice. It speaks better things than the blood of Abel. Hallelujah. Amen. There's a blood that the message is speaking on your behalf. There's a blood that deletes everything not written on your behalf. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. As I close, as I close, as I close, I was called to see a patient. I was called to see a patient who um, was demented. And I wondered why I was asked to see the patient. This patient will always worship. This patient will always worship. I found out that the man used to be a pastor. He forgot his name. He did not remember his name. But he did not forget Jesus. He did not forget Jesus. He forgot everything. He was a true worshiper. And the man taught me a song. He taught me a song. He did not forget Jesus. He was enjoying the presence of God, a true worshiper, despite his dementia. He taught me a song I sing everywhere. And he walks with me. And he talks with me. And he tells me I am his own. I am the joy we share as we tarry there. No other has ever known. 
And he walks with me. And he talks with me. And he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tell me that none of them has ever known. I went to a Betty Hinn crusade. And a lady was on a wheelchair. She was wheeled. She was wheeled to the podium. And Pastor Benny said, what will I have? What would you want me to do for you? Do you want to rise up and walk? She said, no, Pastor Benny. She was crying. She said, the presence I feel on this wheelchair, I'm afraid if I get up, I may lose the presence. She's a true worshiper. Lift up your hands to God. Father, we bless you, O oh God. Make us true worshipers. Ela hayana masini mokosto si mikina ma ilihi kutu sunama ane ne mikina ana aina mahasana ina namo. Let this be a center of worship, of true unadulterated worship. In the name of Jesus, we bless you, O oh God. We give you praise, O oh God. Thank you, Father God, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. True worshipers in the house, pull your hands together for Jesus. Put those hands together.